Brian Stanton here with ASEP Frontline at ASEP 17, talking today with Dr. Chris Baugh from uh, Brigham and Women's up in Boston. Um, fantastic facility, but what you're here for today is you're talking about the, the flip and flopping of the heart. That's what they talk about when folks come into the emergency departments in Kentucky. They say, my, my heart's a flip and flopping. And so we're talking about the atrial fibrillation uh, panel that you are involved with. We actually talked to Dr. Jim Williams as well on another episode of ASAP Frontline. And he kind of got on some of the atrial fibrillation in relation to the NOAX and anticoagulation uh, platelet therapies, that sort of thing. But you're, you're with me to talk about more of the global aspect of this atrial fibrillation panel and some information. It's something that we're seeing more and more often. We have an aging population, so naturally we're going to be seeing a lot of atrial fibrillation. It's something that I deal with every single shift. And honestly, I'm, I'm probably shocking people out of it once every shift or two as well. So tell us about this panel and uh, why it came together. Sure. Thank you for that introduction. And you really uh, hit the nail on the head with, uh, with several of those observations around the frequency that we're seeing atrial fibrillation in our emergency departments and, and really how to manage it. You mentioned shocking patients. That's the main rhythm control strategy that we're actually advocating in, in our, uh, in our uh, panel proceedings. Uh, I was approached about a year ago starting to have conversations around how we can develop tools to help emergency physicians decrease variation in practice around AFib uh, and decrease unnecessary hospitalizations. You know, when you look at the data countrywide around the admission rate for AFib, the U.S. really stands out as an outlier. Uh, we're typically admitting about two-thirds of our uh, AFib patients, whereas if you look at other Western countries, Canada being a good example, they're actually admitting a much lower percentage, about a quarter to a third of their patients. And when you take a deeper dive into what they're doing different than we are, uh, they are much more aggressive around that early rhythm control strategy. Uh, they tend to favor uh, chemical cardioversion as a first line. If you look at uh, Ian Steele and a lot of the work he's put out of Canada with electrical cardioversion being uh, kind of the plan B, uh, in my own practice, I, I usually uh, flip that around and, and, and try to uh, deliver electrical cardioversion as much as possible as a first line since I'm very familiar with, with shocking patients and doing procedural sedation. We do it so, so often in other settings around the department. And the nurses are also much more familiar with that as well. Um, and so uh, thinking about how we can uh, create tools for, the, uh, for ER docs on shift in order to support them, to help them to cardiovert a patient or to start a patient on a new medication, something that could carry risk, something like an anticoagulant that maybe uh, an ER doc does less frequently than a cardiologist or a primary care doc. How can we support them? So we convened this panel that met at ASAP headquarters this past June, um, surrounded with pre-surveys, post-surveys. We're at the point now where we have finalized content and we're trying to get it out to ASAP members and uh, the emergency medicine community, we have that via different ways. One is me being here at ASAP in Washington, D.C. I'm giving some talks at the uh, Innovate ED uh, area on the exhibit floor. I'm doing this podcast. And then we have a manuscript that is close to being finalized that will be submitted uh, for publication. And then we're developing an online tool that will be posted on the ASAP website. And if you're familiar with their sepsis tool, and they have a bariatrics tool now that's available, um, where it's very um, helpful for, for the bedside clinician to pull up even on shift and give some of those very important pieces of information around how to manage these patients. Um, so we, we want these tools to be uh, uh, very accessible, and, um, and we also talk a bit about how you can develop a pathway in your own hospital or emergency department. And to me, having that pathway created in advance is so important. When you're on shift in the middle of 
uh, say, the night in the emergency department, and you have an AFib patient, trying to arrange for follow-up, trying to arrange for an anticoagulation start and make sure that the patient's insurance can pay for a NOAC or some uh, new medication you're starting. If you don't have a pathway in place where all this work has been done for you and you've pre-identified resources and which patients are eligible, it can be really hard to do that. Uh, and as a result, what I suspect happens is the default is admission uh, very frequently because that's kind of an, an easier, safer disposition plan than trying to do this uh, on your own without having those resources available. Interestingly, we've you're the fourth interview that I've done here at ASEP 17, so day one here. And what's interesting about it is all four have had a common theme, though the subject has been completely different. All four have had a theme about, about the cost savings. You know, moving forward, how can we in emergency medicine decrease the burden and cost of the care we provide? And, and you're, exactly what you're talking about is giving the patients what they need in order to keep them out of the hospital. And that is one of the biggest things we can do. The biggest cost is the minute we hit that admit button. And... AFib is a perfect example of the evolution of the treatment of a condition that now, in most cases, does not require admission to the hospital. You know, as I mentioned coming into the show, we had, you know, I'm I'm cardioverting. I prefer electrical cardioversion. Chemical cardioversion to me, you know, I we we do it. It's just not as predictable, and I honestly just see too much hypotension and bradycardia afterwards. And so I would rather give that patient a little sedation, charge the batteries, and fix the problem, knowing that the hemodynamics afterwards tend to be pretty good, you know, especially if we know when they are. And the nice thing about the NOACs is, you know, it, it's, it takes that 48-hour window knowing that they're anticoagulated, and we can go ahead and uh, sedate them and shock them out of it. I mean, of course, work, you mentioned the pathway, working closely with your cardiologist, figuring out follow-up plans. The key to any cardiac measure is do we have that timely follow-up? Our, my particular system is one that's incredible where we have basically 24 to 36 hour follow-up for chest pain related stress tests, for AFib clinics, for heart failure clinics. The whole goal being that we keep their patients out of the hospital as much as possible. And that's the deal you make. You know, they get so upset. A lot of times these specialists get upset. You consult them, admit people to the hospital. You say, all right, we're willing to do this, but here's the pathway. Here's what we have to have. And the main thing we have to have is you guys have to see them. We have to be able to accomplish what we would accomplish as an in, on an inpatient status as an outpatient. Um, and there's a lot of fact uh, factors going into that. But having those pathways in, working with cardiology, saying this is how we're going to help you if you can help us on this end. And working together, and it's actually better for you, better for the specialist, and most importantly, better for the patients. But I hear there's some controversy. Well, in, in terms of, of uh, AFib management, it's interesting. I'm, I'm part of some um, online discussion groups, and there still is, every now and again, uh, someone puts up a question of, um, you know, AFib patient, very confident, went into AFib 24 hours ago, how would you manage? I'm seeing more and more often people being comfortable with cardioversion, but I see a lot of people say, uh, admit for a workup as to why they went into AFib, or, or just hospitalized, it's, you know, less risk. And um, if you look at national authoritative uh, uh, society recommendations around who's safe to cardiovert, um, you, you know, there is this window of up to 48 hours. Um, you do need a good historian uh, to feel uh, confident that you're not putting the patient at a thromboembolic risk with a cardioversion. Um, but for me, for someone who comes from a place that has an observation unit, and I've always been a proponent of observation care in the right patient population, I find that those patients who have an unclear or delayed onset of atrial fibrillation, your OBS unit could be an alternative to inpatient admission. You can put them in your OBS unit. This is assuming they're hemodynamically stable. They don't have a, a concomitant illness going on. We're not talking about the population who's in heart failure and AFib. We're talking about AFib as the reason why they're in the emergency department. Put them in your OBS unit. Some of them will spontaneously cardiovert. Uh, in, in the hours that follow their ED visit. And the, and the OBS unit really extends the window of, of, their, of their visit, right? If in the ED, you really want to get a disposition in two, three, four hours. Once you start going much beyond that, you need to move that bed along and get that next patient from the waiting room in. If you have an OBS unit, you can go 24 hours. If you're a Medicare patient, you may do two midnights that can push beyond 24 hours. 
So it gives you a window to get them either to spontaneously cardiovert, to get a good rate control regimen for them, and that may take some time to establish with the right dose if you're going to start someone on the thiazem or increase their home low pressure dose in order to get that rate controlled. And then if those fail, you might even be able to develop a resource with your cardiologists and your echo lab to arrange for a TEE cardioversion the next day, um, which I'm hearing from some of my colleagues is something that they're doing increasingly. Um, and you can cardiovert someone if you get a good TEE look to make sure there isn't uh, an atrial thrombus. That's unlikely to be arranged from the ED during an ED visit, but if you have uh, the setting of care of an OBS unit at your disposal, you may open up the window for the patients that are eligible for outpatient care. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm approaching this is um, how do you work with these, with these other disciplines? And, and you kind of said it quite well in terms of uh, finding champions in cardiology. If you work with NPs or, or PAs, your APP group would, would need to be involved in this. The nurses in particular, especially if you're going to be managing, say, people who are ongoing rapid AFib in your OBS unit. How are those nurses going to be comfortable managing those patients? Are you going to need a parameter or an exclusion criteria on your OBS care to make them feel comfortable and say, we're not going to put you know, the, the person with a heart rate of 150 and a blood pressure of 80 in the OBS unit that's three floors away. You know, we're going to say we're going to cap the heart rate at 130 and the blood pressure at 100 systolic or something that they feel comfortable with. And they have to be bought into it in order for the, the protocol to actually be used and be successful. Well, some... I think what really buys folks in, um, it, when it's physicians, PAs, nurse practitioner, whoever the provider is, that on these patients, and, it, it, and really any of these, I, f- I feel like so often in emergency medicine, we admit people because of the fear of what it may else represent. So our TIA patient, and if you have the capability, which we do, of getting everything done, including MRI, MRA, in that visit, really what else are you going to add by admitting them to the hospital. And I think the fear, though, with AFib is exactly what you mentioned was, you know, that we're going to admit them to the hospital. Even if we get them back in a normal sinus rhythm, we're going to admit them to the hospital because what else does it represent? What are we else are we going to miss? But are the numbers playing out that we are missing anything or there's any, there's any value gained by keeping these folks in the hospital or with decent follow-up, are the numbers showing that we're getting just as good a a performance measure by sending them home. Is there any significant, other than those that have higher risk, like that we can't cardiovert or have, you know, significant rate changes or significant lab abnormalities or something, something that's a red flag. So say I work somebody up and all the numbers are fine, troponins are fine, the the electrolytes and rest of rest of the things are fine. They feel fine. I've cardioverted them. It may be their first time uh, into atrial fibrillation. But am I missing anything? Am I gaining anything by keeping them, or are they safe to go home? Yeah, I think you're getting at something important here, and that there there is a spectrum of risk. And as a, in working in the emergency department, we have to be comfortable with the degree of risk that we take on, especially when we're sending someone home. And, and I would say for the AFib patient, just like all the rest of your patients, a careful history and exam is, is required to make sure the AFib is not secondary to something else that's important. You know, they are, are they in chronic AFib and they're going fast because they're, they're about to be fully septic or they have a PE, an occult PE or something? Those are things that you need to tease out in your history and exam. If you don't find any evidence of those things going on, I don't think that there is a benefit in hospitalizing them for, quote-unquote, further evaluation of their AFib, especially since AFib uh, is such a common thing in an older age. I mean, you'll see uh, 9%, 10% of the 80 and over population with AFib as just a, a chronic condition of theirs, and, and the incident, incidence increases with age, and we're seeing an increasing aging population, especially those extremes of age, that 80-plus population is growing very rapidly. Um, so I expect us to see this to be happening more common in, in the emergency department. Um, if you look at other countries that manage AFib differently. I mentioned some other Western countries, and Canada is the example I gave, but if you look at the UK and Australia, um, you'll find this similar gap between how they manage AFib and how we typically do in in the United States. And and what what I'm not aware of is any data showing that there's this... uh, 
missed pathology in those countries where patients are turning up, uh, you know, days or weeks or months later, having uh, a large degree of, you know, missed sepsis or missed PE or missed thyroid storm or missed ACS because they were aggressively managed with rhythm control and sent home. Um, so I, I, I don't think uh, the pathway obviates the clinician from, you know, taking good history and taking good exam. But I think um, what I feel comfortable with is that if, if you feel like this is really lone AFib, and that's after your H&P initial diagnostics, um, then you've, you, can, you can then apply a pathway. The first step in any of these pathways is going to have exclusion criteria, right? It's going to have patients who really should still be admitted. And these are patients at the extremes of hemodynamics, right? Like if your heart rate is, uh, uh, you know, uh, very high and, and they're not eligible for a cardioversion for one reason or another, um, you know, if they're totally unstable, then the decision's easy. Then you just cardiovert them because they're unstable, regardless of how long they've been in it, right? But this is gray area in between where you're a bit uncomfortable trying to manage them on your own and you need to admit them. These, these people could be ones that are getting a little hypotensive with your rate control, uh, um, and, and maybe they won't consent to a cardioversion. They've had a bad experience with one in the, previously. You may be forced to admit those patients. Um, you might have patients with renal failure where doing anticoagulation initiation on them is going to be really tricky from the emergency department. They actually might be more of a Coumadin patient, and do you want to do Coumadin initiation from the emergency department? That might be a bit more challenging than, say, a NOAC uh, start where you know they're going to be therapeutic right away and you know what their dose is going to be. Um, the pregnant patient. I mean, there, there's, there's probably a group of patients that you probably don't want to be managing in the ED and sending home. Um, and that's why any good protocol is going to first have those exclusion criteria to kind of peel off those higher risk patients that are going to be hard to manage without help or, or keeping them in the hospital a little bit longer. Exclusions, those are, there's always going to be those. And that's that basically that determination of atrial fibrillation as the primary problem or a secondary indicator, such as your sepsis or your decompensated heart failure or whatever it may be. You got to you got to look into that. I mean, yeah, so absolutely, even with this pathway, you just don't shock somebody, walk out of the room and send their discharge papers. I mean, there's still some information that needs to be gathered. I mean, I have these patients that'll come in every six months or a year and say, hey, it's to happen. It started two hours ago. I know exactly when it is. Those are easy. Those are the ones that are established. They know the process. They know what's going on with them. Then the new onset ones may be a little bit more difficult or a little bit fuzzier histories. And um, you mentioned extremes of age. You know, I had a shift recently where my first three patients together had 288 years of experience. So all three 90 plus years old um, and getting close to that um, centennial mark. And it's, you know, I think that those folks just by being on the property of the hospital qualify for admission. And the great thing is most of those are incredibly healthy people. You don't make it to 90 plus years old by living hard and eating bacon every day in most cases or smoking every day or drinking every day. It's, uh, you know, usually folks that have minical, minimal medical problems. So let's take that. You've talked about, or we've talked about several things here. Let's take a moment to get that high level kind of takeaway from not only the panel and project, but also AFib itself. Great. Uh, so, so to summarize, I, I think what we've highlighted here is an opportunity. Uh, you know, in the emergency department, we make this admission decision, which has a huge impact uh, not just on hospital capacity, uh, healthcare expense, but also on the patient. You know, what, what's the patient's preference? Uh, staying out of the hospital or being able to, uh, or, or, or having to, you know, um, have the, the risks of being hospitalized. And as we're going into flu season now, um, it's not a small risk uh, for some patients, right? So, and, and, that, and doing some shared decision making around what the preferences uh, are can be really important. And you mentioned the patients who are in AFib frequently and get chalked out of it and they come in with like the, the plan. They tell you, they say, I went in two hours ago. This is what I need 200 joules. Uh, and and they, they know what they want. And it, to me, it's a very patient centered thing to do rhythm control in the ED. And so, we convene this panel uh, via the, um, uh, the, the platform of ASAP, which really gave us the opportunity to come together uh, to create tools. And what we really have is um, we have uh, a timeline for creating a, a multidisciplinary work group to make a pathway a reality in your institution. And so this is not institution specific. It can be applied anywhere. And it basically has all the steps you need, including a timeline, to bring a panel together of cardiology, of nursing, et cetera, 
to create and launch and sustain a pathway. Then we have an example of a pathway. Now, we, we uh, think that the basic principles of the pathway can be universal, but there might be pieces of it that are tweakable uh, according to your institution's resources and your patient population. So we want people to take that example and mold it to what works for them. And then we have a list of metrics. These are metrics around how AFib is managed in their institution. I think it'd be wise to run the metrics before even starting the pathway work to see what your current baseline uh, standard of care is in your, in your emergency department. How much AFib are you admitting? What is the opportunity? And then once you put the pathway in place, you want to be able to monitor the pathway to make sure it's being used. If it's not being used, figure out why not. Is it an education piece? Is it a lack of resource piece? Etc. So we want to really help people create and sustain change in their own departments and safely manage AFib in an outpatient setting and avoid hospitalizations. And so these tools will be coming out via a, a manuscript pub publication as well as online via the ASAP website. And we see probably in about a three-month publication window where we start seeing these uh, from now leading into winter 2018. All right, so we got the last thing there of how folks are going to get the, how you're going to get the information out. So keep your eye, eyes peeled for that information that's out there. And that's one of the things that the, a lot of pressure when I was in um, council this, this year towards uh, putting the information out there, accessibility information for the members, that, you know, not just those that are at every meeting and know where things are kind of tucked away, but also making a more friendly website that allows for that dissemination of information because there are an incredible number of tools that are out there and this is going to be an additional one there that can help you with your practice so you are not reinventing that wheel when it comes to uh, dealing with atrial fibrillation. So how can folks get more information from you personally, whether email or the uh, social web? Sure. So I, um, I can be reached personally. My uh, work email address is uh, cbaugh at C-B-A-U-G-H at partners.org. Feel free to reach out to me with questions about the pathway. Um, and then the ASEP website should be having this online tool um, and, and that'll be hosted on the ASEP website. So if you search on the ASEP website for atrial fibrillation, this will come up. We expect that to go up this winter. Um, and then I'm also on Twitter at Dr. Chris Baugh as well. So feel free to, to um, ask me questions or interact via Twitter as well. And what I found is that if you have something, if it's if you don't know the website address, it's ASAP, asap.org, but also if you go to any of the search and you put in ASAP and you put in whatever you're looking for, whether it's the uh, AFib pathway toolkit or whatnot, you can find things pretty easily. There's, uh, it's, I often look for stuff that way as a way to get to things quicker than it is actually going through the website primary. And as for me, you can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Also, follow along on Twitter at Everyday Med. And make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast via SoundCloud or iTunes, whichever way you like to listen. Make sure you're downloading because we are releasing new content every single week. And we want to keep you up to date with the Frontline of Emergency Medicine. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASEP Frontline. Frontline.